Thanks very much, Gareth. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I'm hopefully, um, hopefully I can explain to you a little bit about the way the insurance industry is dealing with the issues of, uh, of climate and climate change. The industry has an abiding interest in, uh, in climatological events, cyclones, storms, bushfires, floods, landslides, tsunamis, coastal storm surge. Accordingly, it has a major stake in any changes to the climate that might alter the frequency, severity and locations of climatological events. Even without climate change, the industry is concerned about increasing exposures through greater aggregations of property risk, for example, through increasing urbanisation or development of coastal areas, river fronts and floodplains. When severity of events increases, there can be an exponential increase in property damage and the severity and frequency of extreme weather events is bound to increase with global warming. So climate change ups the ante for the insurance industry. But note that the industry manages much of the temporal risk of climate change by operating mainly with one-year policies. Hence, much of the risk of climate change, which has a longer term horizon, obviously, than one year, is transferred through annual premium increases to the buyers of insurance. So what then is the, the role of the, uh, of the industry and its reinsurers? The insurance industry is, is built around risk and uncertainty. Indeed, its business is to accept the risks or underwrite the risks of others and to pool those risks to provide protection that facilitates economic activity. In principle, it offers protection at a price against risks that could otherwise severely disrupt the financial affairs of private individuals and businesses, and it frees those individuals and businesses to manage their own affairs without risk of failure for reasons that are outside their control. But when catastrophic events occur, the risk is shared internationally because reinsurers bear much of the risk. They aggregate such risks around the globe. For example, last year in Australia, the Queensland and Victorian floods cost uh, the insurance industry about two and a half billion in claims and Cyclone Yasi nearly one and a half billion. So that total of nearly four billion uh, was shared uh, only partially by Australian insurers. The, fig the figures, accurate figures are hard to come by, but it's estimated that reinsurers funded more than half and perhaps as much as two thirds or three quarters of that total cost of $4 billion. So the biggest risks that reinsurers bear are the consequences of severe weather events. And in any one year, those events are unpredictable as to location, frequency, and severity. By the way, I've drawn uh, today on some materials supplied by uh, Swiss Re, Munich Re, the two largest reinsurers in the world, IAG, local, major local listed insurer, and the Insurance Council of Australia. These four parties are the institutions that currently are having the most influence in Australia on the insurance industry's approach to climate and climate change. How substantial is growing urban, urbanisation and the associated growth in risk exposures? These next two slides supplied by the insurance industry, by the insurance council rather, illustrate how these exposures change over time. This first slide shows the Gold Coast photographs in 1930 and 2007. It's not a surprise to you, but you think about what that means to, to insurers over time. And this one is Miami Beach, 1926 and 2006. So you can see that uh, the insurance industry has got a lot to think about simply with the growth in exposures, irrespective of what changes might occur in climate. What effect then, or how substantial is the climate change effect on insurance exposures? We may not know how much the climate will change or the globe will warm over any given period in future, but we can model and understand firstly the effects of global warming on the frequency and severity of catastrophic weather events, and secondly the effects of these events on insurance losses and indeed on non-insurance losses as well. Munich Re has been studying climate and climate change in depth since the 1970s. As a result, the company has excellent data from the end of the 1970s, and this next chart shows the global frequency of catastrophic weather events. The, the red line down the bottom is seismological events, so if you take them out and look only at weather-related events, the increasing frequency of those events is very noticeable. The next slide shows, this shows uh, natural catastrophes in our region, and this one shows in, insured and uninsured lo losses uh, over the last 30 years. 
These two charts also show an unmistakable increase during the last 30 years. This slide shows the results of research done by Munich Re on the effects of global warming in Germany for natural catastrophe losses in years to come. You should get the, the general picture here that it's, um, uh, you do get this exponential increase in exposures. It demonstrates how substantial these losses are likely to be, likely to be given some assumptions about global warming. It's quite possible that the effects in Australia would be greater than in Germany because overall our weather events are more severe. Munich Re continues to invest in understanding and managing the consequences of global warming, and it, ex it expresses its strategy in three pillars. First one is risk assessment, uh, research, climate liability, prospective risk management, allowing for the possibility of climate change. The second pillar is business opportunities. They're actually offering risk transfer solutions for new, for new technologies, especially renewable energy, for example, performance and delivery contracts for solar and wind plants. These are long-term contracts, typically 15 to 20 years. And their third pillar is investment strategy, applying sustainability criteria to the company's investment portfolio and also making direct investments in renewable energy ventures. Swiss Re is also contributing in this direction. They have been using what they call an economic climate adaptation methodology where for selected cities or regions around the world, they've engaged in studies uh, which seek to um, deal with what's shown on this slide. Firstly, the first column is today's risk, being today's exposures subject to today's weather risks. Second one is the future economic development effect, assuming today's weather risks and tomorrow's exposures. And the final one is um, the effects of climate change, being the impact of any increases on weather risks applied to tomorrow's exposures. Simple idea, but putting it into practice in terms of measurement is, uh, is quite a challenge. Once they've done that, they then do a cost-benefit analysis, uh, looking at all the different risk reduction investments that might be made and choose those which, uh, or they try and then promote those uh, that, that give obvious uh, cost benefits. So the industry is, is very active um, at some levels. Um, but what about future access to insurance? The, the industry is historically cautious about, extend, uh, about extending policy conditions, and especially so in recent years because of concerns that the future may not, not replicate or be predicted by the past. In the expectation of more frequent and more severe weather events in the future, IAG, our own insurer, believes it needs to be ready to mobilise more resources more often to cope with these events. And that was very clear when we had uh, multiple uh, catastrophes occurring last year in the RC floods in two states and so on. IAG expresses three goals in relation to climate risk. First, reduce business risk. Secondly, embrace opportunities. And thirdly, invest in maintaining the availability and the affordability of insurance. Climate change can affect both availability of, of insurance. Availability is the willingness of insurers to offer cover and affordability, which is the willingness of insureds to purchase the cover offered. It is evident that the potential adverse effects of climate change may affect both. Insurers may be less willing to make insurance available that's, that people want, and uh, on the other hand, uh, people who are buying insurance may regard it as uh, not affordable. So there's a need here for the industry to take a longer-term view. In this context, though, insurers and reinsurers are intermediaries. For the insuring community, insurance is a cost-plus game overall, but of course the intermediation by insurers removes risk by transferring it to insurers at a price, thereby fulfilling the fundamental economic role of insurance in facilitating the market economy. Uh, the industry is doing what it can to promote risk awareness. Reinsurers are influencing awareness among primary insurers and also across the community at large. And insurers are, are trying to promote awareness too across the community. They're also attempting to influence government and insurance buyers to improve climate risk mitigation and risk management. Valuable responses by government would include improving uh, building codes and land use planning controls, for example, better data for floods, cyclones, bushfires, um, 
and also uh, investment in risk management and risk mitigation in risk prone areas such as floodplains, rivers and water catchment areas. At one level, the insurance industry does not have to worry very much about climate change because it generally offers, as I've indicated before, one-year policies only and it can adjust prices and terms every year. As a result, it could be said that the industry needs to look only two or three years ahead in managing its affairs. However, the more far-sighted recognise well that the insuring community, both personal and commercial, depends on insurance cover being always available and affordable, and that whenever the industry seems unable to deliver, then government intervention is only a short step away. Hence, we will see continuing investment by insurers and reinsurers in the understanding and management of climate change uh, and uh, well, climate and climate change, and you'll, you'll see, you'll continue to see this struggle between the thinking about what we have to do in the next year and what we have to do, look at five, 10, 20 years ahead. Thank you.